yes, it's sort of an external indicator, but it's a great external indicator that what you're doing is innovative, at least certainly for them and for what they've experienced so far. Maybe it's an idea and you're like, man, I didn't come up with that idea, but maybe the way you explained it was really the first time that person has ever been able to really sink into that idea or that concept. And that means there's an innovative approach there, right? Um, So I think those are questions we can ask ourselves when we don't recognize that we have something that we can contribute to the conversation that no one else has. I think that, um, yeah, definitely going through the innovation piece and the challenge again, you know, we, we forget the things that actually have moved us forward, how we have adapted, how we have thought about things differently. Um, and I know certainly for myself, getting over some of what I would call the, the proprietary of language, of use of language yes. in some instances, and you think, no, just push it to one side because people don't want to listen to that word. And it's, it's, it becomes quite an interesting thing that you then start thinking, but I don't want to get so far away from that thing, but I have to make it something that resonates with people in a different mm-hmm. way. And I think, again, that again comes back to the personality piece as well. We kind of have to get over ourselves a bit along the way to sort of help us actually work out what that message needs to be. Um, so l- let's talk about this, this business about sprucing up a message then. How, how can we... Um, internally critically review what we have and how we talk about things and as you say there are so many different aspects to messaging but what are what are the top things we should be trying to do well the first thing is definitely to just like you said to critique your message you, you need to know what it is to critique it so to take that step back and really objectively view your message and view what you're putting out there and a lot of times this is represented through your content there especially through pieces of content that are forward facing in your business, like your website, like your, you know, whatever social media platform you've chosen as your platform or platforms of choice. Um, Because those are the things that your audience is seeing first and foremost. So um, that's kind of one side of it is the external, this forward facing things that your audience is seeing, taking an inventory of that and making sure that it's still aligned with what you want to be putting out there. But then there's the internal piece as well. There's what is your mission as a business? What is your vision as a business? Where do you want to go? And what do you, what kind of an impact do you want your business to be able to have? Whether it's personally on your life, within your audience's life, or one of those great, a greater social impact. And it, are you working within your business and conveying messaging that is actually going to get you there and then checking in regularly and being like, okay, did I veer off that path a little bit? Do I need to realign myself? Yeah, I think that's, um, they're all interesting points, aren't they? And this, this business about, um, about looking inwardly and actually thinking that I was the person that generated that in the first place. And now I'm looking at it thinking, not so sure I, either I like it or it works or does that just mean I, I got it completely wrong in the first place or we, we go through all these sort of self-doubt moments and then we sort of go searching for that piece of inspiration or as you sort of referenced we get these little nudges or certain words keep cropping up and you start thinking now that's it that's, that's one of the things that's happened and I have to say in the course of the last week I've been sat doing some work around a very particular thing and then just out of nowhere, some of these other things have just sort of started bubbling up in the background and you start thinking, oh, yeah. And it's actually because <laughs> you've sort of taken the time to stand away from it almost that you suddenly become more open to it, more receptive to it, because you're not trying to get the thing done this afternoon and get it finished in that, in that intense way. So benefits of messaging then and how that helps us actually elevate into um, the authority piece into the thought leadership world. Now you've introduced the innovation word in there, of course. Um, what does that journey look like? How, how do we go from thinking I've got a message to taking those next steps into saying, and now I'm going to be a thought leader. How, do, how does that work for you as a, as a transformation? Right. So I do think it does take that intentionality and openness that you were talking about. Um, And I think it takes some experience as well, just so you know what is working for you and what isn't. Um, So I don't think this is an overnight, you know, dust your hands, it's completed kind of process necessarily. Um, But it does take attention. And so the process 
really starts, I think, with um, being open to the evolution that you've experienced as an entrepreneur over time. So that's really what that challenge is about, is allowing people to see how far they come, because that's when you're able to start seeing, wow, I've really gained a lot of confidence in what I do. Um, I have the authority to back it up in terms of maybe I've been on podcasts or radio shows talking about this thing and talking about it more confidently over time. Um, you know, I've had the feedback from my clients that it's really working well for, for them. The expertise piece is building up essentially. Um, and then from there, it's acknowledging the innovation piece. These are the three components of our, of our thought leadership framework. Um, again, what are those times when you really help someone see something in a new way that they've never experienced before? Um, and then finally comes the influence piece. And this doesn't mean having an enormous Instagram following necessarily. Um, it just means that's fortunate, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, really acknowledging like where are those places where when I say something and I, and I am sharing or teaching or, just communicating about something that um, is integral to my business and to my platform that people are receptive to it. And I have maybe small, but I do have an audience of engaged people who are listening and taking that in and they're really changing things. That means you have influence. It may be five people. It may be 500 people. It may be 50,000 people. It doesn't really matter, but because you have um, that that sway on someone you do have influence. And so it's then taking those three pieces together and very intentionally saying, I'm going to use the expertise that I've gained and I'm continuing to develop. I'm going to take my innovative approach. I'm going to take the influence that I do have and very consciously use them together publicly as a force for positive good. And I think that's the key, right? Is you can't just have these three things sitting in buckets and expect to create the vision that you want to create. Um, they actually have to be intentionally used, developed, and grown. I, I, I would definitely say that the intentional word, I think, is incredibly important because I certainly know in terms of, of the work that I do with people around the profit piece, it's one thing for people to be in business and say, oh, yes, of course, I want to make a profit. But there is a world of difference in the people who are really intentional about making that profit. The behavior is different, the way they turn up, the way they show up, the things they do, the speed with which they react for the good and the bad. Um, it really does become a driving force. And I think that there is an awful lot of sort of mid ground available in so many topic areas that the intentional piece, I think it really, it does ring true. You do have to be prepared to put that foot forward faster than the next one and so on and keep it going and keep it going in order to, to keep that um, both the methodology and the evolution going. Because I think that again becomes one of the things about how you start working with clients in a different way, how you start seeing things and responding to things that are going on around you quicker. Um, do you have a definition of a thought leader? What, what does a thought leader look like, look like for you? Yeah. So to sort of distill everything that Marie just said down into the sort of the one sentence definition, a thought leader is someone who is leveraging their expertise and innovation and influence to create positive change or positive good. And I would add usually the, the, the method through which they're doing this is through their messaging, because that is our form of communication with our people. We can't have a leadership platform without having messaging. It's integral. Yeah. No, it makes perfect sense. Um, so personality then, from a thought leadership point of view, um, obviously people respond to all sorts of different things. And you, you, know, you referenced how people use words and think that puns are the right way to go and get clever with wording and so on. This balance of, um, of being seen to have charisma, have a personality, be able to engage, be someone that people want to listen to or read in those sorts of ways. Um, how do we bring that together? How do we get that really authentic feel together as we go through these layers of evolution? Um, I'll say up the food change from that sort of the expertise piece into saying, I know I'm good, but I don't have a big audience and then you start to bring people on board. And so you get this snowball effect. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely several very 
um, actionable steps people can take to, to create that. So um, I think honestly, first, and we, we had this kind of acronym that we created, which I think may still be in the works, um, VAMP, which is um, not necessarily meant to mean vampire, but rather a vamp in music where you're, you're coming back to it again and again because it's changing. So it's that vision piece, um, the audience piece. So we have to know who that is. Um, the mission, because that vision and mission, you know, if we don't have clarity around those personally, you know, that's what everything's writing on. Um, and then the P piece is, um, your pillars, your content pillars. So like, what do you want to be known for? Okay. Are you talking about that thing? And does it connect to what you're trying to accomplish, whether it's something you're trying to sell, get people to take action on whatever it is. Um, so I think that's key. I think another piece of it is allowing yourself to have a business word bank. So we have color banks for our business. We have t- certain fonts that we use, certain stock images, but how often do we actually create a phrase bank or a word bank that's really us um, and really reflects those values and helps us get towards that vision and really reflects the mission. And that way too, as our teams grow, as businesses become more profitable and are able to scale more, that may mean there's more cooks in the kitchen, but this way you're able to kind of bring them all together um, so that you're speaking with a unified voice. Um, so those are just two of the steps. I'm sure there's more <laughs> Jesse that you may <laughs> have to offer. But <laughs> Yeah, well, I think it goes back to the quote from earlier of trust mm-hmm. thyself. You know, it, it, one of the hardest lines to kind of step over for a lot of entrepreneurs is stepping out of the corporate speak and into their own voice. And it's scary for a lot of people because they almost haven't given themselves permission to have a voice in years. And some of them may not even know what that voice is. So there's a discovery period. And that's where it come, becomes really important to revisit the process periodically, because in a lot of cases, you're uncovering who you are and what your voice is as you're creating this content and putting it out here. Uh, we, one of the very first things that we put out when we transitioned our business online was a copywriting character quiz, which essentially helped people decide what their voice archetype was out of five different archetypes. And that was not meant to say that everybody who has a rebel voice speaks in this specific way, but it was a gentle nudge to remind people that they can go beyond what they were told was proper in school and create something that is really authentic to them. And then just practice it until it becomes more comfortable. I think that's the thing, isn't it? It is, it is the repetition that actually gives us the confidence and the, how the words start to flow, how the thought process links things together. And then it starts to become that, that much more natural, I suppose, as well as part of that. Sure. Um, so it occurs to me that whilst we talk about all of these things in, in an online arena, clearly they, the messaging piece um, exists just just the same within brick and mortar world and one of the i have a couple of questions for you around this really um the idea of that sort of traditional ceo management team you've just mentioned corporate voice and people losing their voice um as as that ceo figurehead um i've certainly sat in plenty of rooms with with ceos and you can see that they are totally in tune with their own mission their values what they want their company to look like but it doesn't always translate and filter down into the people who actually are expected to execute and and almost live that dream for that person day in day out is that is that the fault of messaging is it just poor leadership but where do you where do you stand on that I think there can be several different reasons for it. I mean, obviously it's, it could be a case of it may not be the right fit um, for the employee. That certainly is possible. However, I do really believe that this, this kind of thing, it comes from the top and it has to, because if there is, um, if leadership is expected to come from within the ranks only, and it's not supported by the top, that that really leads to frustration, burnout, um, people feeling 
like their, their ideas aren't heard and that they're not respected. However, if the leader says, look, this is the idea that I have and I want each of you to, um, to feel invested in it and to feel like that you can lead and I'm supporting you in that leadership. Um, I really do believe that leaders are here to cultivate other leaders, not to sort of stomp on them with their own ideas and own ways of doing things, right? Um, yep, and so a lot of, exactly. And so a lot of it is a matter of trust. Um, but